So I am Lydia Merrill. I'm an honorary senior fellow of Knowledge Exchange in the School of Environment, Education and Development here at the University of Manchester. And I'm also the chair of an environmental education charity, MEAN. Three years ago, we were invited into the Manchester Institute of Education in week one to talk to a group of postgraduate students training to be maths and science teachers. So we told them what children in schools had asked us. Why aren't we learning about climate change anymore? And what are you adults and teachers going to do about it? These young people were the eco champions in primary and secondary schools all over Greater Manchester. So we passed their challenge on to PGCE students. Then three eco warriors aged about nine or 10 attended the first of Andy Burnham's Green Summits. That's the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Big meeting. They asked questions. And the following year, six PGC students came with us from Mean to work with 300 school students who turned up at the second of the Green Summits. And we began to hear ripples of fury building up. Brave young people were camping out in the snow, striking from school, marching, using megaphones to get their message across, young people organising the launch of their campaign, Teach the Future, in the House of Commons. <clears throat> we learned about climate activism from them. It was intergenerational learning. <clears throat> in the university, the People and Planet Student Society have been beavering away over at least the last eight years, but their ideas didn't appear to have touched teacher training programmes. So over the past three years, PGCE students here at the University of Manchester have been on the case. They want these young people's challenge to be heard. They want climate active learning to happen in schools on their watch. They invited speakers to a conference, the top people they could think of. And they invited all of you as active participants to build this movement. They got their tutors on side and despite the COVID interruptions together, they've planned workshops to begin to share brilliant ideas. They're using physics and maths and biology and sustainable chemistry, even politics, to show how climate change education and action can be achieved as praxis and as intergenerational commitment to help all of us reach our carbon reduction targets. And here in Greater Manchester, that means bringing down carbon to net zero by 2038. So the top person they invited this morning used to be an engineer on the oil rigs. <clears throat> he is now Professor of Energy and Climate Change here at the University of Manchester and at Uppsala University in Sweden, where Greta Thunberg celebrated her 18th birthday last Sunday. He challenges technocratic fraud. He calls out social injustice he speaks truth to power. In fact, that's where I first met him, in his shirt sleeves, in the Manchester Town Hall, explaining to all the local councillors how they had to set a carbon budget and why. So he is Professor Kevin Anderson, and he's going to take the story on from here. Kevin, you've got 40 minutes roughly, and we've got 10 minutes at the end for questions afterwards. So put them in the chat box as we go, go along. Kevin, over to you. Thanks very much for that. I'm just going to share screens. Hopefully this will work, work well. Okay, can you all see that, see that clearly? Yep. Yeah, I'm getting some, getting some thumbs up there. Um, should, should, we, should we mute everybody? Can everybody mute themselves, please? So 
Okay. Um, right. Uh, so I've, I've called this talk here. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, and I've called this talk Hope from Despair, Paris 2 Degrees C and the UK's fair role in delivering on our Paris climate change commitments. And what I'm going to try and do in the next 40 minutes is quite a whistle stop tour, really, through, um, through some, some of the sort of basic science and the underpinnings of, of climate change, but mostly really about what we can do about reducing our emissions, and also very much about how we have to be very careful about the language that is used by government and indeed some of the um, sort of climate change authorities when they're talking about how successful we have currently been. I think we have to often um, treat some of the information we're given with a certain degree of sort of um, a caution, at, at least anyway, at least I have to question what, what has been presented to us. And I'll try and come to that as, as we go through the, uh, through the presentation. Oh. Yeah, that's better, right. So I'm going to start with the Paris climate change commitment, which hopefully you all um, at least reasonably familiar with, or at least aware of, which is back in 2015 and was ratified in 2016. And that commitment um, is for us to take action. And that's really important. It's not just to talk about climate, climate change, but to actually take action to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade compared to the pre-industrial period, the period before we started really to burn fossil fuels, but ideally to aim for one and a half degrees centigrade. And on a cold day, well, I live out in the Peak District, but a cold day out in the Peak District or in Manchester, um, these seem like very small temperature changes, two degrees centigrade, and what does that really mean? But at the global level, that is a huge shift. That's something like six degrees in the poles. Um, it, it will have major implications on weather patterns around the globe. So. Um, you know, a two degrees centigrade rise it is a huge shift in the energy levels in the atmosphere. And in fact, in modern human times, the last 10,000 years or so, um, we've only ever witnessed, well, we've only ever lived through about one degree centigrade of warming. So many of the poor parts of the world recognized this was important and pushed in Paris to hold to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Um, and that's you know, ideally what we should try to aim for. I think that's looking incredibly challenging, if possible at all. But two degrees C still seems to be just about an appropriate threshold. Um, to do this in accordance with the best science, and that's really captured um, in an organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and I'll make quite a lot of reference to them. And they come together every few years and capture, if you like, the world science that has been developed in the previous few years and put this together in, in a major report that comes out every, um, roughly every five years. But also very importantly, and completely ignored by all countries around the world, particularly wealthy countries around the world, to also to take action on the basis of equity. And that's a really major part of the Paris Agreement. But indeed, every, every international negotiation, going right back to 1992, um, equity has been at its core. But then in, in practice, no country has ever taken that seriously, including the UK. Now, my focus today is going to be on mitigation, and that's reducing our emissions, and particularly um, in relation to energy. So agricultural emissions and emissions from food and so forth are really important. About 20% of the warming that we see comes really from the emissions associated with agriculture. But the majority of the, of the warming comes from associated emissions associated with our use of energy, and particularly fossil fuels. So I'm going to be focusing on the energy side, but that's not to say that the emissions from agriculture are, are, are unimportant. They are important. They're just, just the main part of the, of, the, of the story comes from the emissions from energy. I'm taking the UK's commitment at the, at the Paris Agreement at face value. I assumed we weren't lying when we signed up to the Paris Commitment and all of the language that is embedded within it. I also am um, basing the presentation on science and equity, and in that I'm completely ignoring what I refer to here as political and economic sensibilities. So short-term politics and economics, I'm disinterested in those. Um, that's not to say politics and economics aren't important. Of course they are, but just, just trying to placate short-term um, views of the policymakers of the day is, 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 a disinter is not something I'm interested in. And I think if you do that, if you stand back from the challenge and simply say, well, what do we need to do to deliver on Paris according to the science and equity, that, change, that um, frames a far more challenging mitigation agenda, emission reduction agenda, than, than most other analysis will suggest, because typically I think the short-term politics, politics and economics are given far too much credence. Now, I'm going to focus on mitiga uh, mitigation, but I think it's worth saying a few things about impacts right at the beginning, just to remind ourselves. First, that the 1.5 to 2 degrees C challenge laid out in the Paris Agreement is itself unjust. But we can't do anything about that now. We've, we've, we've chosen to go that far, and that, that is the best that we can now deliver. 
but that would not be fair, fair for many people around the world. Already people are dying from, from extreme weather events that are exacerbated, made worse by climate change, whether that's in Mozambique, whether it's in Haiyan with the in the Philippines with the Haiyan typhoon, whether it's in Katrina or Sandy, or um, uh, in, in the regular cyclones and typhoon and so forth in, in Bangladesh. So many people in more climate vulnerable parts of the world are already suffering and already dying from weather events exacerbated, made much worse by climate change. We're already seeing the destruction of some major ecosystems where climate change is one of the uh, multiple factors, but often increasingly a significant factor. So for instance, we are going to lose virtually all, if not all of the barrier reef. That's an a sort of emblematic ecosystem now, but this is also happening to many other ecosystems around the world. They are being fundamentally changed almost overnight. That our own children are gonna to have to live through the, the uh, through our thus far choice to fail to address climate change. And it depends what we do in the future. It may be worse or, or better for them, but certainly they're going to have to live through the implications of our, our, our missions. And um, as I say, many people are already suffering, many people are already dying, um, and this will get worse as we get to a warming of 1.5 and, and, and hopefully no more than two degrees centigrade, ideally just 1.5. But let's not pretend that these are safe thresholds. They are not. They are dangerous thresholds, but they are now the best that we can possibly deliver. So future generations will be affected in, for every species you know, right across the coming century and on into centuries beyond that. So, it's, but as I say, it's the best we can now achieve. So now I want to focus on mitigation about what we can do to reduce our emissions, particularly from, from energy. Um, and well, what does the IPCC, what does the Intergovernmental Panel tell us about the Paris Agreement? And these are huge reports. So I'm just gonna sort of think about this, sort of summarize it in just one line. And that one line here is that it's carbon budgets that matter, not long-term targets. So what we do by 2030, by 2040, or by 2050, in isolation are, are actually irrelevant. And often we talk about um, a, you know, a target for 2030 or 2050 or whenever it might be, because we know that we will no longer be in power then. We'll be retired or whatever it might be, and our children will have to deal with that. But actually what the science tells us, it's carbon budgets that matter. And that means our total emissions of carbon dioxide. So what we put in the atmosphere today will be there for the next 100 to 10,000 years, depending on, some of it will be there for 10,000 years, maybe 20% of it or so. But most of it will be there for 100 years or more. So when we put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, when we burn fossil fuels, we are locking in the future to ongoing climate change. And it's that gradual buildup year on year, or day in, day out, year on year, decade upon decade, that really matters. And that's the total amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere, our carbon budget. And what the IPCC reports have told us, these Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports have told us, that if we're to meet our Paris commitments of 1.5, um, Sue 1.5, or ideally well below two degrees centigrade, more at the, <clears throat> at the at, um, you know, certainly to, to stay well below two, then um, from 2020 across the century, then we can emit about 660 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Now, that probably means very little to many of you here, but every year at the moment, we're currently emitting round about 37 billion tonnes. And so now it starts to make some sort of sense in a, in a language that most of us understand. Um, and that's 18 years. So at a global level, we carry on with current global emissions and bear in mind global emissions, um, at least pre-COVID, will continue to rise. Then we've got uh, only 18 years before we have to have, before we'll have used up all of the carbon budget for 1.5 to two degrees centigrade. So it's you know, a very short time frame. But only that's globally. And we have agreed to respond to climate change on the basis of equity. So we have to come, I will come back to that later because that means something much more stringent for places like the UK, Manchester and other wealthy parts of the world. But before we go on to think about our action, we have to be honest about where we are starting from. Where are we today in 2020? And this does require some significant humility the first report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out in 1990. Now, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know, I haven't seen the pictures of everyone at this event today, but um, I'm sure, sure that some of you will not have been born in 1990. So that we're talking about 30 years. We have known all information, had, we've had pretty much all information at our fingertips um, in relation to how we need to respond to climate change. And yet 30 years on, our emissions are over 60% higher than they were in 1990. So our emissions last year were 60% higher than they were, 62% higher than they were in 1990. And they're still, they were still going up. Now, I agree that COVID has had some impact, and maybe perhaps we can discuss that in some of the question session. But, but pre-COVID, emissions have just continued to rise year on year on year. 
And so despite all of the optimistic rhetoric and nonsense we have heard from politicians, and I would say a lot of co-opted academics and NGOs, what we've actually presided over is 30 years, collectively at least, 30 years of abject failure to respond to climate change, despite all the information being there for 30 years. But isn't, say against this pretty dire backdrop, isn't the UK showing some sort of leadership, particularly in the year of COP? And you hear from the Committee on Climate Change, that's the government's advisory body on climate change, um, that our emissions in 2018 were 44% lower than they were in 1990 and are continuing to come down. But those statements always ignore emissions from aviation and shipping. And the UK, as indeed many wealthier countries, have a lot of emissions associated with both of these. It also ignores the fact is that we import a lot of our goods now from places like China and India and some of the other Asian countries. Um, and that those, those high carbon goods, like my computer here, for instance, um, have a lot of carbon embedded in them, in the, in the production of them. And we ignore ignoring those. So if you take all of these into account to get a picture of our carbon footprint for UK as a whole, then we've seen virtually no reduction since 1990, just 10% in 30 years, less than half a percent reduction every single year. But that's also true for Denmark, Sweden, France, and the EU more generally. So all of the so-called progressive industrialized nations have all failed to bring their emissions down, but they all claim they have. Um, and so, so I think we need to, again, unpick what's going on behind these optimistic numbers that we so often hear and that journalists seem to be unprepared to um, you know, consider in more detail themselves. So we've remained relatively unchanged since, no, oh, sorry, this, I mean, that's a slight screen there as well. So why is it we've failed so abysmally? Well, I think there are a number of reasons which I've referred to here as technocratic, technocratic fraud. There's a whole litany of these, but I'm just going to touch on four of them. First, this whole concept of offsetting, which some of you will have heard about, and certainly if you, if you fly somewhere often, at some aviation companies, some airlines, offer you the opportunity to, to pay some money, usually a very small amount of money, which is then used to ask another poor person elsewhere in the world to reduce their emissions. So it's like trying to you know, lose weight by asking someone else to cut back on the chocolate. It's not going to work. Um, now, this sounds ridiculous, but this occurs everywhere in our society now. There are all sorts of organizations offering these offsetting facilities, but governments have embedded them around the world, particularly wealthy ones, in a mechanism called the Clean Development Mechanism, where we get state-sanctioned offsetting. So the UK government has decided rather than make all the cuts itself, it can pay other poorer countries, it can pay Ghana or India or China, wherever it might be, some other part of the world, to reduce their emissions so that we can carry on with higher carbon lifestyles here. You also get this concept of afforestation, um, which is planting more trees and the trees then at least from a very simple modeling approach they're assumed to absorb carbon dioxide as the trees grow and therefore we can expand our airports and make some claim that we can compensate that by that more tree growing elsewhere but it's much more complicated than that and um, depending on, on where the trees are planted what's the effect on the soil you can actually increase emissions by planting trees um, and then the, the other one which is which has increasingly become a key element of all of the sort of government's analysis, that our governments, but other ones elsewhere, is this concept of negative emission technologies, NETs, as they're often called. And these are technologies that do not exist in, at scale, just a few very small pilot plants, and mostly in the imagination of some academics. But the belief is that our children, or the, the vain hope is that our children in, in some decades to come, will find ways to remove this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere using these negative emission technologies. So they're gonna suck the CO2 directly from the atmosphere and bury it somewhere underground. And this, is, this sounds ridiculous, but this is embedded into virtually all emission scenarios and is deeply embedded into the government's plans for climate change. And indeed the Committee on Climate Change's advice relies heavily on these technologies to allow, that, that then allow us to carry on with relatively high carbon lifestyles in the near term um, passing that buck on to, to future generations. What we haven't done in 30 years is tried to cut our CO2, which is ridiculous. You know, the one thing we know we have to do is cut our CO2. The one thing we haven't done is cut our CO2. I just want to make a comment here, because I'm often said to be far too critical of negative emission technologies. I think we should fund them. We should have research and development on, uh, on these, um, and we should deploy them if they meet broader sustainability criteria, and that's an important um, consideration. But we should reduce our emissions today, assuming they will not work at scale. Because indeed, most of the people who put them in the models, when you talk to them privately, are telling you, we don't think we can deliver this level in reality. So we have to actually just reduce our emissions, assuming they won't work. And if they do work, well, all the better. Maybe there's a very small chance in the 1.5 degree centigrade. It's also worth noting that because there will always be emissions from agriculture, 
uh, some methane and some uh, nitrous oxide emissions, which you cannot completely eliminate. You can eliminate all the carbon dioxide from energy, but you cannot eliminate all the greenhouse gases from agriculture. Then some negative emissions will be required to, to compensate for the ongoing residual warming from these emissions. So let's go back to the UK and just to sort of demonstrate the, the actual the depth of failure. And I think today's an interesting day, you know, not only with what's been happening, or a disturbing day, but not only with what's happening um, over the water in the US, but today the UK government has decided that it's not going to call in um, for inquiry the new uh, or the proposed development for another coal mine in Cumbria. So despite the fact we're supposed to be leading COP this year, the UK government said we're not going to bother to call in this, this development so it can go ahead without, without consideration for its emissions. But in addition to that, of course, if you look offshore, this is uh, the Clare Ridge BP platform that went out first oil that was 2018. And across the life of that, that, of that facility, which will go on till 2035, 2040, perhaps even 2045, that's going to emit about a quarter of a billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. And that's only just gone out in the last um, you know, less than two years. If we look at the, uh, the gas field, the Glengorm gas field in the North Sea, all enthusiastically supported by our government, indeed often by the opposition as well, and, then, and by the Scottish National Party, um, the Glengorm gas field, a huge discovery announced January 2019, um, of course, given the go ahead, and that's roughly 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. But even if we look on land in East Yorkshire, summer 2019, then 13 million tonnes from that new planned um, facility, which is just near, just, just uh, fairly near Hull. Um, but if you go further abroad, look at what British taxpayers' money are being paid for. This is Mozambique, and the UK government there is putting part funding by about a billion pounds. Um, a major uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas facility, which is not for Mozambicans, it's actually for export, including to the UK. Um, the emissions of that are roughly 4 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide uh, across its lifetime. So we are still funding and developing ever more fossil fuels. So if we move away from this generational buck passing, this neg these negative emissions and saying that our children will solve the problem for us, and then come back and say, well, OK, what do we need to do in the UK starting today if we're to deliver on the Paris commitment? Well, to, to really unpick that, we have to understand all the sort of science and the maths of climate change behind it. But in this talk, we're going to park quite a lot of that and say that rather than go through all of that in detail, and which you can ask me about in, in questions, um, or indeed I can point you to various publications that cover that, we're going to think about it in terms of pies, or as a friend of mine keep telling me, this is not a pie, it's actually a tart. So it's, a, it's they say, I can tell that's not, not a proper pie. Um, but anyway, let's, for, for today, we'll consider this to be a pie. And what we have is a global carbon pie, which, as, as, um, as I said before, we know is something like 660 billion tonnes. And that's what we have to spend. That's, that's it. That's the total size of our pie that we can spend or eat um, if we're going to stay within the 1.5 to 2 degrees C thresholds. And this lasts effectively forever, this pie. But what we then have to ask ourselves is how to divide that amongst every country in the world. And so what we've done in some work over the last couple of years, and particularly the paper that came out earlier this year, we've looked at that in relation to the industrialising countries, the so-called developing countries and the developed countries. And we've estimated what would be a reasonable slice for the developed country, for, for, well, for both of those. And then I'm focusing here today on the developed countries on the UK. So we've looked at the slice. Now it could be, depending on how you split the pie up, you can split it on the basis of population, on our historical emissions, on our current emissions, on our capacity to respond to climate change, our capacity to have renewable energy. So there's a whole set of ways you can split the pie up. And we looked at a range of these. And what we got was not a single slice like this shows, but actually a, a range of sizes of slices. And then within that sort of range of slice, that slice or that variable slice, we then asked how much should the UK get of that? And again, you, you can divide that slice depending on another set of criteria like our economies and so forth or whatever it might be. And what, we've what came out of that was that if we are to look at our territorial emissions, which includes aviation shipping, but not including our imports and exports, so um, this is just our territorial emissions, then we can emit between 3.8 and 7 billion tonnes, uh, uh, 2.8 and 3.7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide from now out to the end of the century and beyond. Now, again, that probably means very little to most of you here, but that, that is about nine years of current emissions. So that means that our current emission levels, if we carried on like that, but even before 2030, we would have emitted um, all of the emissions that we could fairly emit to, to make our contribution to the Paris commitments. 
just nine years. That's a completely different story from what we usually hear. Obviously, if we come down fast now, then we have a bit longer. And I'll come back to that in a second. So let's translate that overall total budget into what does that mean every single year, which is what policymakers, indeed many of us, prefer to sort of think about. Well, if we started in January the 1st, 2020, and we're obviously a year late already, then that's 10%, well, over 10% every single year, year on year, until we bring emissions down to zero. But given that it's going to take us a little while to get to 10%, we're nothing like it so far, even with COVID, actually, um, then imagine it takes us till 2025 to get 10% per annum. Then we need to have 20% per annum reductions by 2030. And around set, that, that means around about three quarters of all of our emissions that we emit today must have been taken out of the system by 2030. We, you know, we have to cut back that much. Imagine in our own lives saying, well, okay, that's roughly three quarters of all the fossil fuels we use, we can't use by 2030. That's a huge shift. But more than that, it means that we need to be zero carbon energy. That's our planes, trains, ships, um, you know, um, our industry, our houses, our, our heating, everything has to be zero carbon, not net zero, real zero, absolute zero, no emissions from our energy, by 2035 to 2040. This sounds enormously challenging and is far more challenging than what the government are normally talking about. But that's because we have chosen to fail for 30 years. And because it's a cumulative problem, because it's a carbon budget problem, every year we have chosen to fail, the next year gets harder and harder. And so we now find ourselves in this, what appears at least initially to be almost impossible situation. So this is immediate and profound system change. This is, you can't do this by just adjusting a carbon tax or tweaking some regulation here or there. This is now asking fundamental questions about our lives. And I'm going to come back to the equity within our country, because that's a really important part of this in a minute. So let's just compare this with the government's official position or the Committee on Climate Change. So if you took a politics-based approach or what we're calling a science-based approach to deliver on the Paris Commitment, um, then the politics one, the government, UK government policies, if you look at their pathways, then they're relating to roughly 9 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide across the century. Well, most of it in the next 20 years or so. Um, but actually what the science tells us, we, we can only really emit somewhere near a three. So it's two to three times higher than we're allowed to emit. In terms of mitigation rates, the government's sort of saying roughly 5% per annum, and um, we're saying it needs to be nearer 10 to 20%. These are completely different worlds. And the government one, if the rest of the world failed as badly as we're suggesting the UK government is planning to with its own legislation, its net zero legislation, if you follow that through and the rest of the world followed, followed something similar, then we would argue that's nearer two and a half to three degrees centigrade of warming, as our approach is more based on a sort of 1.5, but more likely two degrees centigrade. And so these are very different worlds. Two and a half to three degrees centigrade is so much more destructive and catastrophic than two degrees, which is, as I said before, not safe, but the best that we can achieve. So if our preferences are effectively to ignore international equity, to pass a huge burden onto our children, to be part of a two and a half to three degree C future and renege on our Paris commitments, then that also fits nicely with today's politics. You can carry on with the current economic market model. And um, it's just really about adjustments to business as usual, sort of green adjustments to business as usual. Then, okay, fine, carry on with 5% mitigation and net zero by 2050. If instead we want to take our international obligations under the Paris Commitment seriously and meet them, um, then we need huge reductions in emissions by this generation starting today. Um, we need to cut in emissions in line with well below two degrees centigrade and basically abide by our Paris Commitments. Then that requires something which is much more like the sort of um, Roosevelt scale of government intervention that we saw back in the 1930s. So it's, it's, it's sort of a level of change that we really haven't witnessed other than probably then and, and after the Second World War when we had to reconstruct Europe after we'd blown it all up. Um, so it's that level of intervention. It's not just a tweaking and adjusting business as usual. This, this requires a profound reshaping of our current economic structure um, and rapid and deep reductions in emissions across all sectors. That's like 10 to 20% per annum, per annum mitigation and real zero by about 2035 for wealthy countries and about 2050, 2045, 2050 for the poorer parts of the world. They have a little bit longer to make that on the equity basis. So what does meaningful action on climate change actually start to look like? Well, I'm going to use an equation here, and people often say you lose a half your audience with an equation, but um, hopefully this is straightforward. It's the, just a simple one that Paris, the Paris Agreement, plus the science embedded in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, then that actually equals equity. 
It's not that equity is a moral decision here, it's simply that's what comes out of the maths. I mean, you can come to this conclusion from a moral perspective, but in this sense, I'm just coming to it from the maths. Carbon dioxide emissions are highly skewed towards just a few people in our society. That's not to say we all, don't, we all have some role in this, but actually most emissions come from relatively few people. And there's an increasing amount of work that's been done on this. Some great work by Julie Steinberg and other people at the University of Leeds, some really good work by the Stockholm Environment Institute, um, and, and also by uh, Lucas Chance and Thomas Piketty um, back in 2015. So emissions are highly skewed, as you can see here, towards the wealthy people around the world. Um, and yeah, and, and th these, some of these people live in China and so forth, and some of the poor countries, but obviously the majority of them are still living in the wealthier countries. Just to, to sort of bring that, that uh, plot down to a sort of a simple way of thinking about this, roughly half of all carbon dioxide emissions around the world come from just 10% of the population. About 70% of all the emissions come from 20% of the population. And that will include people like me. I mean, professors and senior, so-called senior people in our society will all be in this category. And the argument is often made, particularly by people in that category, well, does that really matter? Does it really matter that a few wealthy people have high emissions? Well, just do a bit of more maths, a little thought experiment. If we imagine that we actually thought climate change was a serious issue, um, and therefore across the world, we put in whatever it might be, forms of regulations or laws that meant the top 10% of emitters in those countries had to cut their carbon footprint to the level of the average European citizen. So not, not a, you know, a poor level. I mean, the average European is still quite a high emitter. Um, and that the other 90% of the world's emitters made no change to their life. They carried on life just as they're doing it today. That would actually be a one third cut in emissions just the top 10% cutting to the level of the average European. If, if, and, and everyone else made no change. It just shows you how the emissions are hugely skewed to particular groups in our society. That's certainly true from a global level, but it's also true from unequal societies like the UK and the US, where the, the emissions between you know, a vice chancellor and a cleaner will be hugely different between those two, and we know why. So we need to be able to focus our policies actually on those high emitters, at least initially, so I would argue this all leads us to a sort of a fairly clear three-phase strategy to deliver on Paris. It doesn't tell us what the policies look like, and they all vary depending on our, on our politics, on our cultures, which parts of the world we're in and so forth, but it tells us the overall strategy. And the first thing is because we've got to reduce emissions in the, in the near term, the immediate and near term, then you can't do that with technology. That is always gonna take you a little bit longer to make some significant shifts in technology. So you have to do that through profound changes in behavior and our practices of high energy users. And you know, clearly there are plenty of things we could be doing in universities to, to change our norms, our practices. In the medium term, we need to make sure that we, we ensure that everything that we buy from computers to industrial equipment to cars, wherever it might be, that they're the most efficient that are available. That requires very stringent standards to be put in place by government on everything that we buy. And it will get tighter year on year. Um, so that means we cannot buy a, a, a rubbish A-rated fridge, which is probably using a 60% more energy than an A++ fridge. So we need to make sure that we can only ever buy the best that's available in terms of efficiency. But that will not also solve the problem. We also, as well as these two, we need to make sure that we're putting in place now policies that will see a huge shift in our energy system away from fossil fuels and towards zero carbon alternatives. And that will require also a huge level of electrification. Only 20% of the energy we consume in the UK, and indeed most industrial countries, is electricity. So about 80% of the energy we consume is not electricity. Most of it's just direct fossil fuels in our homes, the gas and our transport with oil. Um, and so we're gonna have to convert most of that to electricity as well. So we're gonna have to see a huge shift in the amount of electricity, but hopefully we can still save a lot of energy through energy efficiency and actually by electrifying transport, and um, particularly things like e-bikes and so forth, you're both saving power because it's a lighter vehicle than a car, and um, it's much more efficient than, than a petrol or diesel engine. Now, this is going to require some, this is where they say how profound this system change is. It's going to re require a shift in the labor and the resources that are currently used by, you know, by the high emitters in our society, by people like me, and we're furnishing our sort of relative luxuries of this high emitting group. Those labor and resources that are doing that are going to be required to help us make this rapid shift to the whole infrastructure that is going to be necessary to be zero carbon energy supply, whether that's retrofitting our houses, providing much more electrification, putting trams in our cities and no more cars in our cities, even no more EVs in our cities, you know, a complete shift in our urban environments and our rural environments to be zero carbon. 
this shift in productive capacity of society, as I said, is is much more akin to what we've what we um, what we can read about in the, the 1930s New Deal and the Marshall Plan following the um, following the Second World War. But I would argue it goes even further than those. It's, it's, it's even more embedded than those and will take us probably one to three decades to do this completely. So where are the catalysts for this change? Because we're certainly not seeing the catalyst for this change in governments. We're not seeing the catalyst for these changes amongst the academic community, the senior people in our society, the NGOs. I mean, we're not seeing these catalysts for change amongst, amongts the usual suspects. So actually where these um, catalysts for change seem to be coming from are from the younger people in our society, whether that's Greta Thunberg, who was very much, and she was herself in this, not as a savior, but as a catalyst for action. But we see that catalyzing action amongst um, some of the, the Friday for the Future um, movement, some of the school strikes and so forth, Extinction Rebellion. Um, so what we're seeing here are voices from civil society that are actually changing the whole tenor of the debate that's occurring within academia and within the policy realm. It's not been driven by the top down, it's been driven by a whole set of people at different um, spheres of, of life. And we're even having this concept of flying shame. Can you imagine having that five, 10, 15 years ago? Now, I th actually, I think the Swedish translation is probably more flying um, consciousness, if you are, or conscience, if you like. It's, it's, it's a, and we reflect on this ourselves rather than shame. I think it's probably a better translation. So what can we do in this, in this change in trying to, trying to further catalyze and, and rapidly make these changes? Well, the first thing I think we have to do um, as individuals is to actually recognize our own big carbon footprints and try as best we can to reduce them. And clearly for those of us that are wealthier and travel a lot and buy a lot more stuff, we have a lot, a lot more things that we can do than other people are more locked into the infrastructure. But ultimately the emissions from, from any one individual actually aren't that important. The, imp the important part is to talk about those changes we've tried to make and, and about, about why we're doing it, how easy it was or how difficult it was, be honest about the challenges that, that, we, that we faced in trying to make these adjustments to our lives um, and also where it was success, successful and where we found things were beneficial. But to be honest about that, so we're starting a conversation. So it's not so much the emissions themselves, but if you make the emission reductions, then it gives you legitimacy to talk about these issues and to learn about them. We need to engage in our university, our place of work, our local council. Um, you know, make our arguments and suggest what, what they can do to make the changes. And when they don't do things that they're saying they should be doing, then we need to hold them to account. And that's also true with our MPs. So email our MPs, get involved in the politics. So they're actually getting emails from us regularly saying, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? You know, expressing our concerns courteously and firmly and as best we can provide as much evidence. You know, ask them why their actions, again, aren't meeting, meeting their commitments. But I think it's also really important when people do things that are good to also say that as well. So to lend support to changes that are being proposed that we think are in the right direction, because we very seldom do that. We're very good, particularly in Britain, at criticizing things. We're not particularly good at saying how well things are going. So to conclude all of this, what I would argue we need are, are new narratives on what constitutes growth, progress, and development. You know, the ones we had previously are no longer appropriate for the challenges that we're facing on climate change. I would also argue they're no longer appropriate for the more difficult challenges we are increasingly facing on sustainability and broad environmental degradation. We need to reframe our values and about how we reward success. We reward what, what we call success in our world nowadays by effectively allowing people to have much larger, larger carbon footprints by increasing their income. Is that any longer appropriate? And I would also suggest that COVID has told us you know, where the value lies in our society and it's been hugely skewed. Very few of the key workers are the ones on the really high incomes. So we need to be rethinking where actually success needs to, how we should, how we should interpret success and then our, our concept of values. We need a much better relationship with time rather than just dismissing the future and ignoring the lessons from the past and really just living in the present. That's been really unhelpful. We need to start to see ourselves as part of this process through time. Um, and in that embed the whole concept of intra and intergenerational equity, where we care about people elsewhere in the world, but we also care about future generations, about our own children and our children's children. But beyond that, we also have a much deeper appreciation of the more than human world, of which we are deeply part. I mean, the, probably the rest of the world can manage perfectly well without us. It did do for, for most of, of life on this planet. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's probably the last 10,000 years that we've started to cause so much, so much devastation, in particular the last 200 years. So it can manage without us, but we can't manage without it. We are part of that, that non-human world and we have to recognize that and start to have deep appreciation for it.
high level to approach approaches to climate change, the ones that we've typically seen, are deeply locked into the 20th century mindset. And we're really reluctant to, to escape that. Yet if we're going to deliver on our Paris commitments and on the broader sustainability agenda as well, I would say, then we need to remodel um, our sort of framing here around the challenges of the 21st century. And in that, I think, although it's going to be hugely challenging to do this, and we've, there's going to be a lot of suffering from the ongoing warming that we, that we can't completely avoid, um, I nevertheless think that we can still just about hang on to an equitable, prosperous, and prosperous by that I mean sort of rich in the sense of values and so forth, and, and the equity elements of our society, not just more and more money and, and material goods. And also a zero carbon future. I think all of that is still possible, but, but we need to be doing this now. Um, we, don't, we can't really wait till after 2030 in new technologies. We have to start making these changes with the tools that we have available today. In 2020, because of our choice to fail for 30 years, climate change has become system change. As Einstein noted, at least it was attributed to him, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And thus far, I would argue that we have chosen to pass on to our children the consequences of 30 years of ongoing insanity on climate change. We've done the same incremental nonsense and rhetoric for, the, um, for 30 years. And we're now facing a future where we have very little carbon budget left. And we now have to, have to really deliver system change if we're going to um, meet our Paris commitments and provide a prosperous low carbon future for future generations. So on that note, uh, thanks very much for listening. This is the paper that the um, presentation was based upon. And indeed, there's a blog associated with that as well. And I also have a Twitter account, which um, somewhere is on there, I think, um, at the top here. Yeah. Um, so I engage reasonably regularly on Twitter as well. So thanks again for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Kevin. Um, that was a shock, really, yet another shock today. Um, to put all that information into one presentation is, is a real challenge and what you've offered us is a challenge because we're talking about action for educators and what can educators be doing. There have been some very interesting um, comments coming through on the chat and some very useful questions, I think. So what I'm going to do is propose, we've got until about quarter past, so I'd like to be as inclusive of everybody who's here as possible. Um, so that gives us about nearly half an hour to have a conversation, a bit of a conversation to start it off. And hopefully this conference will um, trigger more conversations afterwards. But let's start um, with a really interesting question from Chris McLean right at the beginning of the chat. Um, Chris was asking, a question which is really about um, schools. So given that this is a PGTE conference, she's asking how can we ensure that pupils in schools have greater agency and knowledge and humanity to make a difference in the world? And how can experts in climate change, sustainability and conservation support teachers in the development of curriculum design and teaching? So let's start with that. That's that's just something for all of us, really, Kevin, you know, but you're one of the experts that we're relying on. <laughs> well, I might, I might know a lot about climate change, but I have to say I'm very poor on, on my, my sort of, at least on my knowledge and skill level in terms of how you communicate these things within schools and how you get schools engaged. I, I, and actually, to be honest, these, the younger generation, I think perhaps they're teaching my generation more than the other way around about climate change. You know, the Fridays for the Future movement and all this sort of engagement by many people, um, youth movements, not just in the UK, but around the world, and including very challengingly some parts, the poorer parts of the world, where it's very difficult for them to do that, I think, through lack of facilities, but also that often their governments are very locked into to the fossil fuel industries because they're trying to bring money into their own countries. So um, I think the younger generation already have that agency. The point is to go out and is, is, to, is to grasp it that is there. Their voices are powerful. Their voices are powerful at home with their parents. Their voices are powerful within their school, particularly when it's collective. And I think this is often the case. Um, it's a point that Naomi Klein often makes about the, you know, the, the powerless are only, are only really powerless when they're sort of atomized, if you like. When they come together, their power is much, much greater. It's not just the multiple of number of people that are there, it's, it's multiplied beyond that. And so I think if, if, if the um, school children and young adults and so forth want to have agency, then they need to come together. 
to think about what are what are the important issues and don't just listen to to the academics the professors and so forth about what are the important issues they need to think them through themselves in terms of you know the climate science okay we know we have a good grasp of that people like myself and other people worked on this for years what we should do about it we have you know people like i have to be like myself have to be quite humble here we have failed and we need the voices and the ideas of the younger generations who are not locked into the last century in the way that I am, to come up with their thoughts about how we respond. So I think we, it, it's not about me providing advice and guidance to them, it's about people of my generation working in a partnership with people from their generation. You know, we can bring our experience and knowledge of what it is that we've done, but we also require their more sort of innovative insights about how we're gonna to respond to this challenge. But I think they have agency, that agency comes from coming together, I think, and being strong, having been courteous, strong, and a good evidence base. So think through the arguments that you're making. Right, well, this, later on today, you'll be meeting people from Teach the Future. And hopefully you can also stay on for the keynote speakers this afternoon who are two young women from Manchester Climate Action who are taking that initiative, Kevin. So, you know, we, we're not short of brilliant young people. No, no, we're um, not. Connected no. to this. and. I agree, I'm, I'm learning all the time from them, but I think it's, it's a challenge for teacher education because the big thing you said is how do we unlock the 20th century mindset <laughs> that we've all been um, socialized into and how in our training of teachers and other people, there's a good question about trade unions in there, how, how do teacher educators get out of that mindset themselves as we teach teachers have you got any thoughts on that or is that the big challenge that this whole conference is for well i think the big challenge the whole conference is for but that's but that's true in every area i mean it's true in in academia as well i think a lot of the time something behind something deep in us can see where we're locked into things but often I think the failure to bring that to the fore is something about how our system stifles that. And so we have to have that sort of courage to stand for, stand, stand up and be counted and to, and to try to push our, push these views that we have somewhere at the back of us, bring them to the fore, develop them. And, and it will be difficult to, you know, putting out ideas that are completely novel and, and I'm gonna, and often in this case, I think because we've left it so late, are gonna require significant change. Uh, you, know, it, you have to have quite a lot of courage to put that forward, which comes back to my idea of trying to do it collectively. And the more of you that are there, the easier it is to do that. And I hear that certainly from younger colleagues, you know, younger academic colleagues, it's quite hard for them to speak out because the system tends to stifle that. So I, I said, again, I don't think it's that we're lacking the, the you know, people that aren't lacking the, the, the insights about how we can make these changes. There are multiple ways we can make these changes. And I don't think there's, a, there's one right response to that. But I think what we're lacking is that courage to stand up and try out, try new things. And I think in that, again, it's that coming together of, of groups to try and lend support to each other. You don't have to agree with someone else, but you're lending support for them to voice their views on something. Right, okay. That's a challenge for teacher educators. C can I go back to um, John Fox's question? Because I'm a member of a trade union, UCU, and there's a green network of UCU uh, green activists all over the country and probably internationally. Um, what can we be doing? What can trade unionists be doing? Because quite clearly, employers will go with the cheapest option to make the biggest prof profit unless we get them to change their mindset. What, what do you think we can be doing with trade unions? Well, I mean, they're, they're a import, hugely important body in, in trying to drive change. But I think engaging, you know, so the, if UCU could try and engage with some of the other trade unions. So trade unions have also been an obstacle to some significant change. So some of the work I've done with politicians um, particularly in the Labour Party, but other parties as well, particularly the Labour Party, actually some of the unions there have been a real obstacle to try and drive change. And you can sort of see why, because their, their principal objective is, is, is to try to, um, to protect the, 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 the workers that they're representing. And so if you're representing an oil company or the oil industry, then it's quite difficult to know, well, how do you do that? So I think actually having other unions like the UCU engaging with them, talking about well, how do you make a just transition and that whole language of just transition is something the unions need to be deeply involved with and, and not ever be pulling back from it, but saying, well, Hoka, how do we put it into practice? Because the language of just transition as academics, we love using that sort of language. But the reality is, you know, for, for people, they've got to be able to pay their mortgage this week and next week and the week after. And so that just transition has to be practically implemented. 
So we can't talk about it just in some sort of theoretical sense. You've got to say, how do you practically bring that about? And I think there is a really real role there for the trade unions to engage with each other. And for people like the UCU, who are obviously not so easily locked in to a high carbon infrastructure or, or, or basis as, as say some of the manufacturing and industrial unions are, to work with those other unions to try to, to, to put in place the nuts and bolts that would be necessary to make that transition. All the skills that we see in some of these other sectors that are high carbon, those skill sets are often ones we require in making the transition to a low carbon future. You know, if we're going to roll out trams and e-bikes and uh, retrofit our houses and massive electrification and more renewables, the skill sets we're using in the oil industry and the other and other industries that are high carbon, those skill sets are going to be required, most of those, to make this transition. And so going through that process of how you make that trust just transition and, and bring the other unions with us, I think is important dialogue that needs to go on within the trade union movement. OK, thank you very much for that. I think it's really interesting that local authorities are here at this conference. I'm looking at a, a really interesting com contribution from Wigan, one of our Greater Manchester authorities. Um, you know, we don't have climate change on the face of the national curriculum um, anymore because of one of our politicians removing it. So an authority like Wigan, which has gone out of its way to make sure that all its schools are eco schools and that they all have um, a subject that ecology is actually on the face of things. Mm. How, how far do you think we as um, trainers of teachers can work with local authorities to big up the importance of behavior change and using our scientific and ecological knowledge? Mm. Well, I mean, if you've got progressive councils like Wigan, um, you know, driving eco schools um, agenda, and that's that, that's I mean, that itself is really helpful. The problem, I think, is when you've got authorities that are not not that progressive, and sadly, not all of them are. Um, and so, perhaps again, it's the it's it's trying to bring you know, engage with Wigan and other similar progressive councils to say how can you uh, how can you engender that in other councils that are reluctant to make those changes. So where the door is easy to already open, it's easy to push. But I think it is actually bringing to those different um, sets of interests together, like the council, like some of the people in the schools that are doing this and showing how it can be done to other, other local councils and the benefits from doing it as well. Mm. Um, I rather hope that we're starting to see more engagement across some of the devolved administrations, <clears throat> councils and <clears throat> regional authorities and so forth on environmental and climate change issues. I mean, this, it's becoming more of a vogue subject. So perhaps there is, a, there is a shift there. So maybe we are already pushing at a door that is slightly ajar anyway. But I think often examples, and, and particularly examples that aren't just from, say, just from the schools, but from the schools and the local authority themselves, those combination of examples are really useful. But we have to, we have to give those to other, other authorities. They can see how it can work. These, I have to say, these questions are probably ones that are well beyond my uh, expertise to answer. Well, that's why we're doing this together. And yeah. that's why it's so great to have so many people here from those different backgrounds. Yeah. Um, just, just to bring us back to, to schools, there's some interesting conversation going on here between Rachel and Sue about leadership um, by teachers. Now, most teachers at the moment are completely hunkered down, shut down, stuck with their computers, having to produce um, materials for online learning completely committed to what's written in the national curriculum. So it's probably the worst time ever yeah. to try to be innovative. However, there's a lot of you here. There's a lot of you thinking about how we can use outdoor education and outdoor learning. Have you got any ideas about, um, and I think maybe I should throw this out to everybody because I think everybody here is thinking, how can we make a difference in our school given that most people who are here are science teachers and therefore have quite a lot of clout in a school, how could they make a difference by allying with other teachers in the school so that they don't look like they're a bunch of wacky scientists <laughs> and they are trying to make the big picture difference to the whole planet? Yeah. One quick thing on this. Okay, this is this, this, I feel this is a bit stretching my 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 um, expertise well outside it where it's comfortable, um, and it, this this was also true for universities as well for the teaching that goes on there, is that of course right at this moment school teachers are having to be very innovative, because they they're having to figure out how on earth do we teach children 
when we can't see them. Uh, you know, we're not seeing them in, in the normal environment that we would expect to see them in. And so teachers are being innovative right now as our lecturers and so forth, because they're trying to figure out how on earth are we going to carry on, you know, um, you know, engaging with our students. And, and, and so perhaps whilst they're actually doing that, this is almost like a, is, is this an, isn't this an opportunity for saying that as we are having to be quite deeply innovative, I think, um, isn't this an opportunity to add other elements in there, which bring the environmental component, the sustainability area uh, issues in there, issues of um, what do we mean by being progressive, issues of value, those other sorts of broader sets of progressive issues, bring those into our already uh, innovative process of having to think how on earth are we going to carry on with you know, doing this for the next umpteen months. So that is already, we, we're already being innovative. And in that, we're also being innovative. And this is different, I think, probably for schools. But at least you can start to talk about that with some of the, some of the uh, school children here, is that um, actually the process of having to use, like we're doing now, Zoom, these, this, is a, this is one of the multiple tools that we have that allow us to have lower carbon lifestyles and still have a lot of engagement. Now, some people have found this quite hard to engage by Zoom. For me personally, I always prefer it to the old physical engagement. And I like having some of those physical engagements. And I think that's very different probably for schools. But for me as an academic, I've found Zoom a really helpful way to engage. It allows me to have more engagement. And actually it feels closer often because I see the faces of people. Um, they're just somewhere in the distance behind the light. I can't see who they are. Um, and so all I'm saying, saying there is watch we, what we are doing now, the lessons we are having to learn because of COVID has changed some fundamental aspects of our lives. Let's let maybe the teacher can start to think, well, what are the positive lessons we can learn from that that we can embed in our teaching and try to engender new ways of thinking, which the school children already got anyway, I think probably they're probably well ahead of us again um, and try and, and, and bring those together. And that through that, we can start to think about some positive lessons from COVID that go with the innovative teaching that, that, that the, that the um, teachers are having to do today simply because they can no longer get together in the classroom. Okay, okay, so there's, and of course, um, Andy's reminding us that alliances are made with math teachers as well, who've got equal amount of status in school, so yes. <laughs> I, hope all, Let, I, well, I never thought of status in schools. I'd rather hope that all the teachers had status in schools oh, regardless well, of their um, subject. I'm, wor I'm worried about the status of, of design and technology uh, teachers in schools because they're critically important, aren't they? Anyway, all, that's another story for another day. Yeah, all subjects are critically <laughs> important. Yeah, and it's interesting that going back to some of your technical uh, discussion, for example, clean development mechanisms and negative em emission technologies, this is the sort of thing where school students who use philosophy for children can be asked to analyze what on earth these concepts really mean. So are we, do you think there are ways in which science teachers, math teachers, the teachers who are here in this call, how we can use that kind of questioning technique within mm. our, our school regime to open things up so that we do enable those young people who wanna do more than just get out on a Friday with a megaphone that they can actually make a difference to the curriculum in the school? Yeah, I mean, this sort of smacks a little bit to me of what, what we sort of touched on just a moment ago, actually. It, it, the real world is not split into maths, physics, philosophy, whatever it might be. It's not, that's not, I mean, we've done that. That's, and, and it's been really helpful, that reductionism down to its separate parts has been helpful, but it's also really problematic because the real world isn't like that. So when we think about something like negative emission technologies, there are the technology issues there. There's the science issues. There's all of those issues. And there's all the ecological issues associated with it as well. But there are also the deeply philosophical issues that this is something that's going to occur in the future with future generations and with different sets of issues of risks and uncertainty. So actually, to really think about that as a concept, it's not a simple technology. It's, it's like all technologies. Technologies are sort of embedded in our society. In this case, it's a, it's a technology that doesn't really exist. We just hope it will in the future. And so there are multiple ways you need to look at that. So I think it's, in, it's key then to, within our schools, to start to say, how can we embrace a more interdisciplinary way of thinking about these issues and, and inculcate that in, in the school children? Because I don't think reductionists think, I think, in the 21st century, I think probably even much of the 20th century, you know, if you like the reductionist thinking, which, is, which continues to be very helpful, but it also brings about real problems. And I think we're gonna have to start to, to rethink how do we have more, system level ways of analyzing issues. And the, the problem for my generation is that we completely brought up with reductionist thinking. 
and we're trying to sort of dip our toes into this thing called being interdisciplinary. But I think with the school children of today, who will be the adults of tomorrow, if they could be thought, helped to think through this sort of more um, interdisciplinary way of addressing all, all issues, not just climate issues, but all issues, that would be really beneficial. So no longer are simple things black and white, looking at it with one discipline. We don't, you know, and we start to recognize that they're much more complex than that. And I think if we can embed that in our children today, then they'll be much better and well-informed adults to help us progress to the 21st century. Thank you very much, Kevin. I think that's the point at which we're going to have to stop. Oh, but okay. I've really appreciated all these fantastic questions. They will keep them, and as, as, as they're a huge resource, I know that people are putting up contacts with different schools, different ways of getting into YouTube materials. So we'll we'll do a little report based on this. But we do need to be moving on towards some of the workshops, and the workshops are going to be run by young people, by teachers by activist educators themselves. So we've really appreciated the challenge you've given us. It's been vital to get that challenge. And we're challenging you to keep in touch with us because we need you, Kevin. Um, we need you to be there in your shirt sleeves, <laughs> those counselors, what, the, what they gotta do because they're not doing it quick enough. No. And they're not no, doing it hard enough. So but there are plenty of, plenty of other colleagues, say with the Tyndall Centre and other ones, particularly, I think, for issues like you know, you're discussing today, or at least for, for, for thinking about schools and school children, that are probably much more afraid with that than I am. A lot of my Tyndall colleagues are a lot younger than I am and, and know as much as I know, but actually they're, they're more familiar with how to engage with, with the younger generations. I think right. I still struggle with that. This is an intergenerational process. Yeah. And we're all in it. So we thank are. you very much for that. Yeah, we really friend. appreciate it. I'm going to hand over to Andy to do the kind of interim bit between now and the workshops. Okay. Thank you very much, Kevin. No problem. Bye. 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 Bye.